This is a LibriVox recording. For more information, please visit LibriVox.blogsome.com. This reading is by Neil Foley. Podchef.motime.com. LibriVox, Section 5. Lord Lambeth came to see them on the morrow, bringing Percy Beaumont with him, the latter having instantly declared his intention of neglecting none of the usual offices of civility. This declaration, however, when his kinsmen informed him of the ad advent of their American friends, had been preceded by another remark. Here they are, then, and you are in for it. What am I in for? demanded Lord Lambeth. I'll let your mother give it a name. With all respect to whom, added Percy Beaumont, I must decline on this occasion to do any more police duty. Her grace must look after you herself. And I will give her the chance, said her grace's son, a trifle grimly. I shall make her go and see them. She won't do it, my boy. We'll see if she doesn't, said Lord Lambeth. But if Percy Beaumont took a sober view of the arrival of the two ladies at Jones's Hotel, he was sufficiently a man of the world to offer them a smiling countenance. He fell into animated conversation, conversation at least that was animated on her side with Mrs. Westgate, while his companion made himself agreeable to the younger lady. Mrs. Westgate began confessing and protesting, declaring and expounding. I must say, London is a great deal brighter and prettier just now than it was when I was here last, in the month of November. There is evidently a great deal going on, and you seem to have a good many flowers. I have no doubt it is very charming for all you people, and that you amuse yourselves immensely. It is very good of you to let Bessie and me come and sit and look at you. I suppose you will think I am very satirical, but I must confess that that's the feeling I have in London. I am afraid I don't quite understand to what feeling you allude, said Percy Beaumont. The feeling that it's all very well for you English people. Everything is beautifully arranged for you. It seems to me it is very well for some Americans, sometimes, rejoined Beaumont. For some of them, yes, if they like to be patronized. But I must say I don't like to be patronized. I may be very eccentric and undisciplined and outrageous, but I confess I was never fond of patronage. I like to associate with people on the same terms as I do in my own country. That's a peculiar taste I have. But here people seem to expect something else. Heaven knows what. I am afraid that you think I am very ungrateful, for I certainly have received a great deal of attention. The last time I was here, a lady sent me a message that I was at liberty to come and see her. Dear me, I hope you didn't go, observed Percy Beaumont. You are deliciously naive. I must say that for you, Mrs. Westgate exclaimed. It must be a great advantage to you here in London. I suppose that if I myself had a little more naivete, I should enjoy it more. I should be content to sit on a chair in the park and see the people pass and be told that this is the Duchess of Suffolk and that is the Lord Chamberlain and that I must be thankful for the privilege of beholding them. I dare say it is very wicked and critical of me to ask for anything else, but I was always critical and I freely confess to the sin of being fastidious. I am told that there is some remarkable, superior, second-rate society provided here for strangers. Mercy! I, I don't want any superior, second-rate society. I want the society I have been accustomed to. I hope you don't call Lambeth and me second-rate, Beaumont interposed. Oh, I am accustomed to you, said Mrs. Westgate. Do you know that you English sometimes make the most wonderful speeches? The first time I came to London, I went out to dine, as, as I told you. I have received a great deal of attention. After dinner in the drawing room, I had some conversation with an old lady. I assure you I had. I forget what we talked about, but she presently said, in allusion to something we were discussing, Oh, you know, the aristocracy do so-and-so, but in one's own class of life it is very different. In one's own class of life? What is a poor unprotected woman to do in a country where she's liable to have that sort of thing said to her? You seem to get hold of some very queer old ladies. I compliment you on your acquaintance, Percy Beaumont exclaimed. If you're trying to bring me to admit that London is an odious place, you'll not succeed. I'm extremely fond of it, and I think it the jolliest place in the world. 
Poor Vu ought. I never said the contrary, Mrs. Westgate retorted. I make use of this expression because both interlocutors had begun to raise their voices. Percy Beaumont naturally did not like to hear his country abused, and Mrs. Westgate no less naturally did not like a stubborn debater. Hello, said Lord Lambeth. What are they up to now? And he came away from the window where he had been standing with Bessie Alden. I quite agree with a very clever countrywoman of mine, Miss w Mrs. Westgate continued with a charming ardor, though with imperfect relevancy. She smiled at the two gentlemen for a moment with terrible brightness, as if to toss at their feet upon the native heath the gauntlet of defiance. For me there are only two social positions worth speaking of, that of an American lady and that of the Emperor of Russia. And what do you do with the American gentleman? asked Lord Lambeth. She leaves them in America, said Percy Beaumont. On the departure of their visitors, Bessie Alden told her sister that Lord Lambeth would come the next day to go out with them to the tower, and that he had kindly offered to bring his trap and drive them thither. Mrs. Westgate listened in silence to this communication, and for some times afterward she said nothing. But at last, if you had not requested me the other day not to mention it, she began, there is something I should venture to ask you. Bessie frowned a little. Her dark blue eyes were more dark than blue, but her sister went on. As it is, I will take the risk. You are not in love with Lord Lambeth. I believe it perfectly. Very good. But is there by any chance any danger of you becoming so? It's a very simple question. Don't take offense. I have a particular reason, said Mrs. Westgate, for wanting to know. Bessie Alden for some moments said nothing. She only looked displeased. No, there is no danger, she answered at last curtly. Then I should like to frighten them, declared Mrs. Westgate, clasping her jeweled hand. To frighten whom? All these people, Lord Lambeth's family and friends. How should you frighten them? asked the young girl. It wouldn't be I. It would be you. It would frighten them to think that you should absorb his lordship's young affections. Bessie Alden, with her clear eyes still overshadowed by her dark brows, continued to interrogate. Why should that frighten them? Mrs. Westgate poised her answer with a smile before delivering it. Because they think you're not good enough. You're a charming girl, beautiful and amiable, intelligent and clever, and as bien élevé as it is possible to be. But, but you're not a fit match for Lord Lambeth. Bessie Alden was decidedly disgusted. Where do you get such extraordinary ideas, she asked. You have said such strange things lately, my dear Kitty. Where do you collect them? Kitty was evidently enamored of her idea. Yes, it would put them on pins and needles, and it wouldn't hurt you. Mr. Beaumont is already most uneasy. I could soon see that. The young girl me meditated a moment. Do you mean that they spy upon him? That they interfere with him? I don't know what power they would have to interfere, but I know that a British mamma may worry her son's life out. It has been intimated that, as regards certain disagreeable things, Bessie Alden had a fund of skepticism. She abstained on the present occasion from expressing disbelief, for she wished not to irritate her sister. But she said to herself that Kitty had been misinformed, that this was a traveler's tale. Though she was a girl of a lively imagination, there could in the nature of things be, to her sense, no reality in the idea of her belonging to a vulgar category. What she said aloud was, I must say that in this case I am very sorry for Lord Lambeth. Mrs. Westgate, more and more exhilarated by her scheme, was smiling at her again. If I could only believe it was safe, she exclaimed. When you begin to pity him, I, on my side, am afraid. Afraid of what? Of your pitying him too much. Bessie Alden turned away impatiently, but at the end of a minute she turned back. What if I should pity him too much? she asked. Mrs. Westgate hereupon turned away, but after a moment's reflection she also faced her sister again. It would come, after all, to the same thing, she said. Lord Lambeth came the next day with his trap, and the two ladies, attended by Willie Woodley, placed themselves under his guidance, and were conveyed eastward through some of the duskier portions of the metropolis to the great turreted donjon which overlooks the London shipping. 
they all descended from their vehicle and entered the in famous enclosure, and they secured the services of a venerable beef-eater, who, though there were many other claimants for legendary information, made a fine exclusive party of them, and marched them through courts and corridors, through armories and prisons. He delivered his usual peripatetic discourse, and they stopped and stared, and peeped and stooped, according to the official admonitions. Bessie Alden asked the old man in the crimson doublet a great many questions. She thought it a most fascinating place. Lord Lambeth was in high good humor. He was constantly laughing. He enjoyed what he would have called the lark. Willie Woodley kept looking at the ceilings and tapping the walls with the knuckle of a pearl-gray glove, and Mrs. Westgate, asking at frequent intervals to be allowed to sit down and wait till they came back, was as frequently informed that they would never come back. To a great many of Bessie's questions, chiefly on collateral points of English history, the ancient warder was naturally unable to reply, whereupon she always appealed to Lord Lambeth. But his lordship was very ignorant. He declared that he knew nothing about that sort of thing, and he seemed greatly diverted at being treated as an authority. "'You can't expect everyone to know as much as you,' he said. "'I should expect you to know a great deal more.' declared Bessie Alden. "'Women always know more than men about names and dates and that sort of thing,' Lord Lambeth rejoined. "'There was Lady Jane Grey we have just been hearing about, who went in for Latin and Greek and all the learning of her age.' "'You have no right to be ignorant, at all events,' said Bessie. "'Why haven't I as good a right as anyone else?' "'Because you have lived in the midst of all these things.' "'What things do you mean? Axes and blocks and thumbscrews?' All these historical things. You belong to a historical family. Bessie is really too historical, said Mrs. Westgate, catching a word of this dialogue. Yes, you are too historical, said Lord Lambeth, laughing, but thankful for a formula. Upon my honor, you are too historical. He went with the ladies a couple of days later to Hampton Court, Willie Woodley, all being also of the party. The afternoon was charming. The famous horse chestnuts were in blossom, and Lord Lambeth, who quite entered into the spirit of the Cockney excursionist, declared that it was a jolly old place. Bessie Alden was in ecstasies, and she went about murmuring and exclaiming. "'It is too lovely,' said the young girl. "'It's too enchanting. It's too exactly what it ought to be.' At Hampton Court the little flocks of visitors are not provided with an official bellwether, but are left to browse at discretion upon the local antiquities. It happened in this manner that, in default of another informant, Bessie Alden, who on doubtful questions was able to suggest a great many alternatives, found herself again applying for intellectual assistance to Lord Lambeth. But again he assured her that he was utterly helpless in such matters, that his education had been sadly neglected. "'And I am sorry it makes you unhappy,' he added in a moment. "'You are very disappointing, Lord Lambeth,' she said. "'Ah, now don't say that,' he cried. "'That is the worst thing you could possibly say.' "'No,' she rejoined. "'It is not so bad as to say that I had expected nothing of you.' "'I don't know. "'Give me a notion of the sort of thing you expected.' "'Well,' said Bessie Alden, "'that you would be more what I should like to be, "'what, what I should try to be in your place.' "'Ah, <laughs> my place!' explored Lord Lambeth. "'You're always talking about my place.' "'The young girl looked at him. He thought she colored a little, and for a moment she made no rejoinder. "'Does it strike you that I am always talking about your place?' she asked. "'I am sure you do it in great honor,' he said, fearing he had been uncivil. "'I have often thought about it,' she went on after a moment. "'I have often thought about your being a hereditary legislator. A hereditary legislator ought to know a great many things.' "'Not if he doesn't legislate.' "'But you do legislate. It's absurd your saying you don't. "'You're very much looked up to here. I am assured of that.' "'I don't know that I ever noticed it.' "'It's because you're used to it, then. You ought to fill the place.' "'How do you mean, fill it?' asked Lord Lambeth. "'You ought to be very clever and brilliant, and to know almost everything.' Lord Lambeth looked at her a moment. "'Shall I tell you something?' he asked. "'A young man in my position, as you call it.' "'I didn't invent the term,' interposed Bessie Alden. "'I've seen it in a great many books. "'Hang it! "'You're always at your books. "'A fellow in my position, then, "'does very well whatever he does. "'That's about what I mean to say.' "'Well, if your own people are content with you,' "'said Bessie Alden, laughing, 
It is not for me to complain. But I shall always think that, properly, you should have been a great mind, a great character. Ah, that's very theoretic, Lord Lambeth declared. Depend upon it, that's Yankee prejudice. Happy the country, said Bessie Alden, where even people's prejudices are so elevated. Well, after all, observed Lord Lambeth, I don't know that I am such a fool as you are trying to make me out. I said nothing so rude as that, but I must repeat that you are disappointing. My dear Miss Alden, exclaimed the young man, I am the best fellow in the world. Ah, if it were not for that, said Bessie Alden with a smile. Mrs. Westgate had a good many more friends in London than she pretended, and before long she had renewed acquaintance with most of them. Their hospitality was extreme, so that one thing leading to another she began, as the phrase is, to go out. Bessie Alden, in this way, saw something of what she found in a great satisfaction to call to herself English society. She went to balls and danced. She went to dinners and talked. She went to concerts and listened. At concerts, Bessie always listened. She went to exhibitions and wondered. Her enjoyment was keen and her curiosity insatiable and, grateful in general for all her opportunities, she especially prized the privilege of meeting certain celebrated persons, authors and artists, philosophers and statesmen, of whose renown she had been a humble and distant beholder, and who now, as part of the habitual furniture of London drawing-rooms, struck her as stars fallen from the firmament and become palpable revealing also sometimes, on contact, qualities not to have been predicted of sidereal bodies. Bessie, who knew so many of her contemporaries by reputation, had a good many personal disappointments, but, on the other hand, she had innumerable satisfactions and enthusiasms, and she communicated the emotions of either class to a dear friend of her own sex in Boston, with whom she was in voluminous correspondence. Some of her reflections, indeed, she attempted to impart to Lord Lambeth, who came almost every day to Jones's hotel, and with whom Mrs. Westgate admitted to be really devoted. Captain Littledale, it appeared, had gone to India, and of several others of Mrs. Westgate's ex-pensioners, gentlemen who, as she had said, had made in New York a clubhouse of her drawing-room, no tidings were to be obtained. But Lord Lambeth was certainly attentive enough to make up for the accidental absences, the short memories, all the other irregularities of everyone else. He drove them in the park, he took them to visit private collections of pictures, and, having a house of his own, invited them to dinner. Mrs. Westgate, following the fashion of many of her compatriots, caused herself and her sister to be present at the English court by her diplomatic representative, for it was in this manner that she alluded to the American minister to England, inquiring what on earth he was put there for, if not to make the proper arrangements for one's going to a drawing-room. Lord Lambeth declared that he hated drawing-rooms, but he participated in the ceremony on the day on which the two ladies at Jones's Hotel repaired to Buckingham Palace in a remarkable coach which his lordship had sent to fetch them. He had on a gorgeous uniform, and Bessie Alden was particularly struck with his appearance, especially when on her asking him rather foolishly as she felt if he were a loyal subject, he replied that he was a loyal subject to her. This declaration was emphasized by his dancing with her at a royal ball, to which the two ladies afterwards went, and was not impaired by the fact that she thought he danced very ill. He seemed to her wonderfully kind. She asked herself, with growing vivacity, why he should be so kind. It was his disposition. That seemed the natural answer. She had told her sister that she liked him very much, and now that she liked him more, she wondered why. She liked him for his disposition. To this question, as well, that seemed the natural answer. When once the impressions of London life began to crowd thickly upon her, she completely forgot her sister's warning about the cynicism of public opinion. It had given her great pain at the moment, but there was no particular reason why she should remember it. It corresponded too little with any sensible reality, and it was disagreeable to Bessie to remember disagreeable things. So she was not haunted with the sense of a vulgar imputation. She was not in love with Lord Lambeth. She assured herself of that. It will immediately be observed that when such assurances become necessary, the state of a young lady's affections is already ambiguous, and, indeed, Bessie Alden made no attempt to dissimulate, to herself, of course, a certain tenderness that she felt for the young nobleman. She said to herself that she liked the type to which he belonged, 
the simple, candid, manly, healthy English temperament. She spoke to herself of him as women speak of young men they like, alluded to his bravery, which she had never in the least seen tested, to his honesty and gentlemanliness, and was not silent upon the subject of his good looks. She was perfectly conscious, moreover, that she liked to think of his more adventitious merits, that her imagination was excited and gratified by the sight of a handsome young man endowed with such large opportunities. Opportunities she hardly knew for what, but, as she supposed, for doing great things, for setting an example, for exerting an influence, for conferring happiness, for encouraging the arts. She had a kind of ideal of conduct for a young man who should find himself in this magnificent position, and she tried to adapt it to Lord Lambeth's deportment, as you might attempt to fit a silhouette in cut paper upon a shadow projected upon a wall. But Bessie Alden's silhouette refused to coincide with his lordship's image, and this want of harmony sometimes vexed her more than she thought reasonable. When he was absent, it was, of course, less striking. Then he seemed to her a sufficiently graceful combination of high responsibilities and amiable qualities. But when he sat there within sight, laughing and talking with his customary good humor and simplicity, she measured it more accurately, and she felt acutely that if Lord Lambeth's position was heroic, there was but little of the hero in the young man himself. Then her imagination wandered away from him, very far away, for it was an incontestable fact that at such moments he seemed distinctly dull. I am afraid that while Bessie's imagination was thus invidiously roaming, she cannot have been herself a very lively companion. But it may well have been that these occasional fits of indifference seemed to Lord Lambeth a part of the young girl's personal charm. It had been a part of this charm from the very first, that he felt that she judged him and measured him more freely and irresponsibly, more at her ease and her leisure, as it were, than several young ladies with whom he had been on the whole about as intimate. To feel this, and yet to feel that she also liked him, was very agreeable to Lord Lambeth. He fancied he had compassed that gratification so desirable to young men of title and fortune, being liked for himself. It is true that a cynical counsellor might have whispered to him, Liked for yourself? Yes, but not so very much. He had, at any rate, the constant hope of being liked more. End of section 5